Boeing B-29 Superfortress, now a decaying hulk. It once crippled an empire and in a single stroke of terror ended a war and changed a world forever. Its recurring echo still sounds from those gone but not forgotten days. April 1942, under the command of Colonel James H. Doolittle, 16 B-25B Mitchell bombers lifted off the rolling deck of the U.S. carrier Hornet. With a belly full of bombs and fuel, they were bound for the Japanese home islands, the first direct bombing assault on Tokyo. It proved a costly but needed boost to Allied confidence, but demonstrated a desperate inadequacy, a strategic long-range bomber. A weapon foretold in Doolittle's post-mission statement. We're going back to Tokyo, and we shall go in full array and with mighty allies. The B-24 Liberator, an extremely versatile bomber, could not meet the range, speed, altitude and load requirements now envisioned by the War Department. Neither could the B-17 Flying Fortress, another magnificent plane. While they flew countless successful missions over Europe, they were already being outmoded by designs on the drawing boards back home. The huge Douglas XB-19, first flown in 1941, was a flying laboratory to test the principles of big aircraft. In 1940, the War Department called for a bomber capable of speeds, altitudes, loads and ranges that the underpowered 19 couldn't match. It became a competition between the Consolidated and Boeing companies. The Consolidated B-32 Dominator, powered by four Wright R3350 engines, specified for use by the War Department. It was pressurized, and although large, it was not seen to break any major new ground. It would just fulfill specifications, but offering little more than a conservative step forward. Adopted as an insurance policy, if the radical Boeing Model 345 failed, only 15 B-32s saw active duty, although over 100 were built. The winning design was the Boeing Giant, designated XB-29. Top speed over 350 miles per hour, ceiling over 30,000 feet, range approximately 4,000 miles with a 10,000 pound payload. The maiden flight of the first XB-29 was on September the 21st, 1942, over Boeing Field, Seattle. Test pilot Eddie Allen reported that low horsepower was a problem but in flight, the big aircraft handled superbly. The early Sperry gun system and three-bladed props seen here were not incorporated in later models. Much important data was obtained from this first XB-29. Not so with the next XB. On its second flight, it burst into flames. Eddie Allen, his 10 crew and 19 civilians perished. Such horrifying losses were not allowed to impede a project which the war depended on. The XBs were soon back flying. The B-25 Mitchell is a big strapping bomber, 67 feet across the wings, but it could reach Japan only if it took off from an aircraft carrier. Much bigger is the famed B-17 Fortress. 104 feet from wing tip and tip, it has ranged 1,400 miles over Japan's island conquests. But it cannot reach Japan itself from any base we now hold. The Super Fortress, wingspan 141 feet, longer than the Wright's first flight through the air at Kitty Hawk. Range, altitude and bomb load, secret. By June 1942, the first of 14 pre-production drab-painted YB-29s were airborne. The theories of the radical design on trial. The 29's huge bomb bays were set forward and aft of center of gravity. To maintain stability during drops, an intervalometer released payload from alternate bays. Inside, crew quarters were heated, pressurized and soundproofed. In the forward compartment, the bombardier sits in the extreme nose of the plane, below and between the pilot and co-pilot. The pilot sits on the left, the co-pilot on the right. 
The navigator is behind the pilot, facing forward. The flight engineer is behind the co-pilot, facing aft. The radio operator is behind the flight engineer, facing right. In the aft compartment, along with a rest area, are the gun commander in a barber's chair, observing through a plexiglass blister atop the aircraft. The two side gunners to the left and right of him. Notice the early blister cages to stop crew being sucked out if a blister pops. The tail gunner mans the putt-putt auxiliary starter motor. His normal position is in the pressurized tail compartment. The huge wings, set mid-fuselage, were quite radical. Boeing departed from the conventional bridge truss configuration, settling on a web-type structure. Flaps increased wing area by as much as one-fifth for low-speed flight, takeoff, and landings. The retractable twin-wheeled tricycle landing gear was a great advantage for such a heavy aircraft during high-speed landing runs, even after extensive combat damage. The 29 used another innovation, the General Electric Remote Gunnery Control System. All guns were sighted and fired remotely. Four of the turrets, two on top and two beneath the fuselage, can turn through 360 degrees in azimuth, 90 degrees in elevation. The tail turret is more restricted in movement, but it has a 20 millimeter cannon in addition to the twin 50s the others carry. But the big thing about the 29's armament is the fact that the gunners don't touch the guns. The guns are controlled remotely from special sites, and any gunner can fire almost any turret. For example, one side gunner might have control of two turrets, firing four caliber 50s at his target. A small central computer made corrections for wind, temperature, altitude, speed, and extended range by correcting for bullet drop. Gunners using this remote system experienced no jarring recoil and gun vibration, easing the task of holding a target in sight. Gun camera footage of fighters shot down is terrifyingly real. The camera is activated by the firing mechanism. It is seen here, mounted between the twin machine guns of the aft lower turret. Long, high-altitude flights called for pressurization. The 29's circular cross-section hull gave the necessary uniform strength. The Boeing auto pressure regulator controlled pressurization. There were three pressurized compartments. The nose compartment, connected via a long 34-inch diameter tube to the aft gunner's compartment. The tail gunner's compartment was also pressurized. The fact that it was pressurized and the altitude was brought down to simulate 8,000 feet, that whenever any kind of a window pops out or a rupture from, uh, if it's in combat, uh, in the uh, fuselage would cause a sudden rush of air out of that to equalize the pressure. And uh, especially when you're at higher th altitudes in the thin atmosphere. And so because we had to travel from the forward deck to the back over the bomb bay through a tunnel, which was a little bit confining in that you couldn't wear your parachute with you, but while you're in that tunnel, if you should suddenly depressurize at that time, you got the feeling that you might be a projectile in a cannon going <laughs> shot right through the, the tunnel. <laughs> so it was a little apprehensive about going in there at times, especially at high altitudes. The massive engines were at the time the most complex and powerful ever built. Four Wright R3350 radials, turbo supercharged to produce 2,200 horsepower. The huge props were geared to rotate very slowly for high altitude performance. This was a very special aircraft. Spurred on by Pearl Harbor, the U.S. now geared up for wartime production. By January 1942, B-29 orders were doubled to 500. Labor shortages foreseen. Processes were simplified for unskilled workers. 
Designs were broken down into components for allocation to many production facilities throughout the US. Final assembly production lines also span the nation. Boeing's Renton plant in Washington, the Martin plant in Omaha, Nebraska, Boeing's new plant in Wichita, Kansas, and Bell's Marietta plant in Georgia. 1,600 B-29s would be ordered before a single prototype had flown. But not all was in the swing. The B-29 project had slowed to a crawl, crippled by its vast logistic and organizational problems. The Battle of Kansas was about to be fought. August 1943, Canada. At the first Quebec conference, Allied chiefs were planning new strategy. Expecting European victory in a year, 
the Allies now marshal their forces against Japan. The President knew that distances had put a premium on long-range air power. To strike Japan, he had a new weapon. Roosevelt promised 200 B-29 superports by March 1944. Inside the Chateau Frontenac at the Joint Chiefs Conference, General Arnold proposed to pierce the inner zone of Japan's homeland with the unbuilt bombers from bases to be erected in China. It was a bold plan. At the time of the Quebec Conference, we only had 11 superforts. Hap Arnold's motto was to become famous. He announced, the difficult we do immediately. The impossible takes a little longer. The situation was that the B-29 had to be sent to war within a specified time. And uh, it was the job of the people uh, under the command of Arnold to make that happen. So they ended up with a situation that they had approximately five weeks to get the B-29 into action. And unfortunately, they found the worst weather conditions possible. They had problems with transportation of parts. And uh, they also were dealing with a situation where they had partly trained crews who were trying to complete modifications to the airplane. Um, as things went wrong and had to be replaced, these crews learned on the job. And you had a situation, for instance, where they were fitting modified radar sets, but they had never fitted radar sets before of any kind. Under direct presidential pressure, Arnold stepped in. It said 60 armchair generals turned up to impress him, but he meant business. Signing the 175th 29, Arnold demanded it be ready by March the 1st, 1944. By the 28th of February, the Hap Arnold special, plus all 29s ahead of it, had been rolled out. Before the superfortress deployment to India and the Pacific, an elaborate cover plan was executed. Hobo Queen, the only YB to see active duty, was sent to India via England. It toured the UK for two weeks in an attempt to mislead the Axis to believe the 29 was to be used in Europe. Not an hour after landing, a German reconnaissance aircraft was seen flying overhead. China, the focus of Japanese aggression for many years. Here was an opportunity to strike back. Mainland China offered forward bases close to Japan for the new B-29s bound for permanent bases in India. Pacific posed the problems that bore the concept of the 29. The B-17 and B-24 had both proven great aircraft over Europe with shorter distances from base to target. The Pacific posed huge logistic problems, vast expanses of ocean that conventional warfare had not yet encountered. The B-29 was simply the only aircraft that could reach Japan. The 20th Bomber Command was specifically created to hold the B-29s together as a single force to strike Japan. The 58th Very Heavy Bombardment Wing was made up of the 40th, 444th, 462nd and 468th Bombardment Groups. They were bound for the heat and dust of India, half a world away. Travelling east, the first stop, Gander Bay, Newfoundland. Across the Atlantic to Marrakesh, Cairo, Karachi, and finally Calcutta. In preparation, thousands of Indian workers and US construction troops had upgraded Indian airstrips to take the big bombers. The bases were scattered around northeast India at Karangapur, Chakulia, Piadoba, and Dudkindi. The forward bases in China lay on the plains of Chengtu just in range of the southern islands of Japan. From Calcutta, everything had to be ferried in a massive airlift operation across the jagged peaks and deep gorges of the Himalayas, the treacherous hump covered in ice and cloud that lay before the vast plains of Chengtu and the forward bases. Converted 29 tankers flew the route. 
three gallons used for every one gallon of fuel offloaded at Chengtu. Four airstrips were constructed, each 8,500 feet long, to service the huge bombers. Each rock was turned into handmade gravel to fill and flatten the old rice paddies. China mobilized its one huge resource, people. Over a third of a million laborers worked on the construction, using simple barrows, buckets, and wooden tools to reform the landscape. Fighter aircraft also had to be accommodated. Strips were built for them in southwest China. These rollers weighed up to 10 tons and were hauled by as many as 100 men. The sheer manpower was staggering. But all this cost money. Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek charged the U.S. government over $200 million in gold for the effort. By April 1944, B-29s were landing in China, ready for the raids of June. Raids that would prove disappointing. The long distances, much at high altitude, the treacherous Himalayas, the golden airstrips of Chengdu transformed into $200 million bogs by torrential rain. The initial conception that the B-29 could be self-supporting, a fallacy. The fuel run across the hump couldn't keep up with demand. After the first raid of June the 14th, raids were held up for a protracted period as there were only 5,000 gallons of suitable fuel in the whole of China. These bases would not spell the defeat of Japan. There were many raids from these Chinese bases, but range from China limited targets the 29s just being able to reach the southern tip of Japan, only biting at its heels. The turning point came mid-1944, when after much bitter fighting, the Marianas Islands were wrested from the Japanese. The loss caused the fall of the Tojo cabinet. These were, for the B-29s, the stepping stones to Tokyo. The three islands, Guam, Saipan, and Tinian, were only 1,500 miles from Japan. Construction of five B-29 bases on the three islands commenced. Crews working hard coral formations into airstrips through tropical heat and sudden rainstorms. On October the 12th, 1944, the first B-29 landed on Isley Airfield, Saipan. Jolton Josie, the Pacific pioneer, carried the new commander of the 21st Bomber Command, Brigadier General Haywood S. Hansel. As Arnold's chief of staff in Washington, he directed the India-China offensive. He would now control the 21st from the Marianas. Well, the, the first element of the 21st Bomber Command has arrived. When we've done some more fighting, we'll do some more talking. Right. Hansel was a planner and a staunch believer in strategic, high-altitude precision bombardment. The bombs rained down on industrial and economic targets throughout Japan, but results were again poor. B-29 losses grew as the enemy concentrated defensive fighter squadrons around these targets. The high altitudes the B-29s had to climb for such raids were causing huge operational difficulties, many aircraft ditching on the long journey back to the Marianas. Arnold needed results. Hansel was relieved of his command, Arnold replacing him with General Curtis E. LeMay. Maybe this man could turn the tide. Iwo Jima, captured soon after LeMay's appointment. The island sits around halfway from the Marianas to Tokyo. Japanese held, it was taken by U.S. Marines in February, March 1945, with tremendous loss of life. The still hot volcanic rock of Iwo Jima was carved into an unsinkable aircraft carrier. Now there was a safety stop in emergencies, fighter escorts for the B-29s, and Japan was being pushed back at last. LeMay, not a devotee to any specific tactical doctrine, would try new ideas to get results, ideas that would eventually burn the heart out of Japan. 
Well, I'd say that they respected and feared him, but they knew that he could do the job and hopefully would keep them alive. Um, previously, they'd been suffering serious losses in the B-29s, and uh, LeMay came along, changed the tactics, made the airplane work. LeMay found that Hansel had built the B-29 bases in the Marianas into a well-organised war machine. The Navy had shipped in massive stockpiles of cargo to service the vast armada, safely out of range of Japanese attacks. LeMay could see no reason for the 29's failure to perform, apart from the tactical use. He had the weapon. It was a case of using it in the right manner, efficiently and to its full devastating potential. LeMay would at first allow missions to continue as before. Daylight raids hitting from high altitude in formation using heavy explosives. He would observe the characteristics of the missions and devise a startling plan. Missions were planned in great detail and the map rooms collated huge amounts of data. Here was the control center for all B-29 operations against Japan. Even as these bombs rained down on Japan's cities, LeMay had pieced together the Offensive of Fire, a campaign that in just 11 days would put to the torch 29 square miles of urban area. In the following months, more fire raids paired with an extensive aerial mining campaign would choke and starve the nation. Removing all guns and ammunition except the tail armament and leaving the gunners behind would mean a huge saving in weight allowing more payload of the new M69 incendiary firebombs. At night, the 29s would approach the target at five to 8,000 feet in single file, guided by Pathfinder B-29s, marking the target with a huge cross of fire. LeMay observed that Japanese anti-aircraft guns were not greatly effective at low to medium altitudes, and their night fighter capabilities were very limited. 
Lower altitudes meant more range, needed three times greater payload and less strain on the engines. Engine fatigue was perhaps the worst enemy during these high altitude raids. These factors formed the base of the LeMay treatment. Flying back to the Marianas after missions, the crews now had the haven of Iwo Jima for emergency landings. Many dropped in where before it was a long, limp home, with every chance of a ditching in the vast Pacific and little chance of rescue. Iwo was a godsend. After Iwo was the long flight back to Tinian, Saipan and Guam. Most 29s returned safely to fly again. But not all were nearly so lucky. In the first great fire raid, 14 aircraft out of the 279 29s sent out fell to a similar fate. Bad losses but in comparison minor. For that raid, during the night of the 9th of March 1945, is considered the single most destructive air raid ever, outdoing the infamous Dresden raids and both atomic attacks. Unusually high winds that night fanned the many fires into a storm. Violent air currents thrust the bombers up thousands of feet, the fuselages blackened by smoke. Tokyo could be seen glowing 40 miles away. This is not Hiroshima. In one night, nearly 16 square miles, 25% of all the buildings in Tokyo were destroyed. One million homeless, 150,000 dead, injured or missing. The LeMay treatment was a terrifying success. The bases in the Pacific were no island paradise, sometimes hot and dusty, sometimes wet and muddy. Low morale was ever present, men living close together in tent cities, a cargo culture far from home and the ominous fear of not returning from the next mission. The B-29 became a part of the crew. Pampered like a new Cadillac, a certain amount of customizing went on. For example, the official decision to remove the 20mm tail cannon was not seen by some crews as a desirable step. The twin 50 machine guns alone would certainly not be much of a discouragement to enemy fighters. This menacing bit of set dressing made of tin was rigged up by one crew. Just the sight of this monster cannon kept fighters well out of range of its non-existent sting. Customizing of another kind was the famous B-29 nose art.
When the order came to remove the nose art, there was a ripple of discontent. But in a military situation, orders were orders. Where the order came from, nobody really seems to know. There is one version that says that a number of B-29s went back to the United States and when the nose art was seen, there were objections to the uh, lurid nature of it and therefore the order came back to the people in the combat zone to remove it. Other versions of that story are that it was decided at the group level by the group commanders. Some wanted to run a cleaner operation than others. The men's high regard for their aircraft made their loss seem even greater. Jolt and Josie. On April Fool's Day 1945, a small explosion was seen shortly after takeoff. She burst into flames, plunging into the bay off Saipan. Super Wabbit, lost February the 19th, 1945. The Japanese suicide attack tore off both wings. She went down. No survivors. Little Joe, hit over Mia Kanojo on April the 29th, 1945. The crew bailed out. Only six of the 11 men were rescued. Noah's art gave them names to be remembered by, but this is surely the most unforgettable name of them all. On the 16th of July, 1945, US scientists exploded the first atomic device. In under one month, a modified B-29 of the specially created 509th Composite Group would carry the 9,700 pounds uranium bomb high above the city of Hiroshima. After a photographing session that make it, made us feel like a Hollywood premiere, we uh, got off at about uh, 3 o'clock in the morning in the darkness and headed for Iwo Jima, which we reached about sunrise. We made uh, certain adjustments and tests on the bomb during that flight. We then headed for the Empire, and uh, the weather improved as we went along. We felt that it was our lucky day, and we knew it was as we made the final approach toward Hiroshima, which the navigator hit right on the button. The bombardier took over, identified the target, and everything went with perfection not approached in the rehearsals. A bomb was finally released exactly at the designated hour, and the explosion occurred as planned. Uh, my navigator had me perfectly lined up with the target. When I touched in with my sight, I could clearly see the city of Hiroshima within my bomb sight. Then I clutched in and took the run, and I felt the bump of the airplane. I was greatly relieved because I knew the unit had gone from the airplane that we had successfully delivered. It meant so much to the Army Air Forces, American science, and industry. The bomb was armed in flight by Captain Parsons to avoid any mishap on takeoff. And Ola Gay flew unopposed over Hiroshima. the airplane, we took over uh, manual control, made an extremely steep turn to try and put as much distance between ourselves and the explosion as possible. After we uh, felt the uh, explosion hit the airplane, that is the concussion waves, uh, we knew that the bomb had explosion, had exploded, everything was a success, so we turned around to take a look at it. The sight that greeted our eyes was quite uh, beyond what we had expected because we saw this cloud of boiling dust and debris below us with this tremendous mushroom on top. Uh, beneath that was hidden the ruins of the city of Hiroshima. At 9.15 on the morning of the 6th of August, 1945, 4.5 square miles of Hiroshima and 78,000 of its inhabitants ceased to exist. The Enola Gay, named for Tibbet's mother, remains the single most destructive weapon used in anger. Japan, in shock, couldn't come to a decision on peace. The B-29 boxcar carried the second bomb over Nagasaki. Another city disappeared under a billowing mushroom cloud. 
Fears of death on the war's last days were fueled as bombing went on after Nagasaki. All bombers returned as peace was declared. The war was over, but the B-29 still had much to accomplish. With a post-war surplus of 29s, variants appeared. The Pakusan Dreamboat was a B-29B, modified for long-distance flight, stripped bare inside, extra fuel tanks installed, Andy Gump chinless nacelles fitted, and tyres filled with low-weight helium. It was to break the world distance flight record in November of 1945. The flying fuel tank flew 8,198 miles in 35 hours. In 1946, on the Marshall Islands in the South Pacific, the B-29 atomic bomber would launch the tests of a more powerful A-bomb. Arriving aboard the B-29, the outlaw, a familiar face, General LeMay, now Deputy Chief of Staff of Research. The Marshall Group, 5,000 miles from the US, surrounded by vast stretches of ocean. The first test target, Bikini Atoll. The B-29 Dave's Dream was specially modified to hold the test bomb in its bay. It would deliver the payload over a target of 93 unmanned naval vessels clustered around the tiny atoll. Other 29s would act as weather planes, flying laboratories and photographic platforms. Unmanned radio-controlled B-17 drones would fly through the fallout cloud to collect samples. Naval observation ships sat 14 miles from aim point. At 34 seconds past 9 a.m. July the 1st, the atoll and the naval target ships were rocked by a massive blast. Beginning Operation Crossroads and a string of nuclear bomb tests into the 50s. The B-29 was the true pioneer of USAF in-flight refueling systems. In this drogue probe system, fuel was transferred down a long hose to the receiver aircraft. The pilot having to close in to the end drogue with a probe seen here on the wingtip. Much more successful was the Boeing patented flying boom. A rigid telescopic tube was literally flown into position by an operator in the old tail gun compartment. An aerodynamic V-shaped wing at the tip of the arm allowed steering. A panel of lights on the belly of the 29 gave the receiver pilot instructions to hold position. During normal flight, the arm could be pivoted under the tail. Coupling and decoupling can be seen closer in this footage of a KC-97 tanker and an early B-52 using the flying boom system pioneered by the B-29. The Soviets had a B-29 of their own, the Tupolev Tu-4, was a direct copy of B-29s interned during the war. 1,200 were built. The Hap Arnold Special was ironically one of the 29s methodically taken to pieces and copied bolt for bolt. The SB-29 Super Dumbo was basically a B-29 equipped with survival and rescue gear. Its main feature was an A3 lifeboat carried under the fuselage, which could be dropped to downed crews. Sixteen SB conversions were carried out. The huge A3 lifeboat must have been a blessing to count as it was motorized and carried all manner of survival equipment. First flown in 1947, the B-29D's designation was changed to B-50. The B-50 had a much stronger airframe. Later models had 700-gallon wing tanks and a one-piece plexiglass nose gun. 
Its Pratt & Whitney R4360 engines produced 3,500 horsepower. The huge tail had a folding tip to allow it entry into USAF hangars. With the B-50 and new B-36 in their arsenal, the USAF could afford to loan the RAF 87 B-29s, designated the Washington Bomber. The B-50, the first aircraft to circumnavigate the globe non-stop, was the final variant of the B-29. In the late 40s, the Super Fort would play another crucial role in the advancement of aviation. This time as a mothership for early experimental supersonic aircraft. At the Air Force Flight Test Center, Edwards Air Force Base, the Bell rocket-powered research aircraft X-1 would attempt to break the sound barrier. A B-29 was used to air launch the parasite aircraft at around 30,000 feet. In a series of flights, USAF test pilot Major Chuck Yeager took the X-1 Glamorous Glennis up close to the sound barrier. On the 14th of October 1947, Jaeger punched the X-1 beyond Mark I into the smooth airflow of supersonic flight. So began a string of B-29 parasite launches that changed the face of aviation technology. The loading of these X-planes was quite interesting, as the huge B-29 had to be elevated on stilts. The parasite X-plane was rolled underneath, then hoisted clear of the ground and recessed into the modified bomb bays. Another peculiar parasite aircraft was tested from the B-29. The XF-85 Goblin air-launched fighter was designed to be carried by the Convair B-36. The Goblin could be launched, then picked up after completing its mission. When war broke out in Korea in 1950, the B-29 was to play an active and crucial role in support of the UN troops. Used mainly in a medium-level interdiction role, it destroyed bridges, roads, and enemy communication lines. The B-29 was said to be an easy target for the Soviet MiG-15. No match in speed, altitude, or firepower. But the Superfortress dealt many a harsh blow, dropping 167,000 tons of bombs in 21,328 sorties. They operated on all but 26 days of the war, shot down over 30 fighters. 34 superforts were lost in all. The B-29 also deployed the mammoth Tarzan radio-controlled bombs to devastating effect. In the heat of Korea, nose art surfaced again. The 29s were soon adorned with pretty girls and comic characters. But once again, 
Once again, the sensors moved in. By the end of the Korean War in 1953, the B-29 was deemed obsolescent. It was soon relegated to only second line duties. The last operational B-29 flew its final mission, a routine radar evaluation flight, on the 21st of June, 1960. I think the, the crews who were flying the B-29s were proud of the fact that they were flying the most advanced aircraft in the world at the time. And in one specific case, a pilot who flew B-29s during World War II has always insisted that when he flies on an airline, it must be an airline flying Boeing planes. We more or less had the feeling that we were having the Cadillacs of airplanes. It was the, the uh, super bomber. Because of that, we were all quite proud. And it was a good plane. 